It is widely known that in his political will, Octavian Augustus warned his heirs against expanding the empire. Such an act had its own logic. His heavy campaign in Germany, which led to heavy losses and required huge material costs, did not bring any benefit to the empire. But the internal and external peace led to the flourishing of the state, and it was necessary to continue such a policy in order to preserve it. But just 30 years later, the empire would invade Britain and conquer the island in a bloody campaign. Why this happened, and whether it was worth it, we will discuss in this video. Octavian was undoubtedly the most authoritative man of his time, a demiurge, who in the flames of civil wars forged the Republic into an empire so that the Republicans thanked him. His words carried weight with the entire society of the empire. But what do words mean compared to the experience of generations? And this experience, which became part of Roman culture, whispered that only in wars you can ensure the greatness of both yourself and the power. It was wars that created the empire. It was wars that ensured an unprecedented standard of living in Rome, not only for the aristocracy, but also for the plebs. One failure with Germany, which was rich only in barbarians, did not mean that it was necessary to stop expanding the borders altogether, because there were so many more riches waiting to be conquered. And so the war party in Rome did not cease to exist for a single day in spite of any words and wills of the divine Augustus. In order to bring back the spirit of the old school lacked only one thing, the desire of the emperor. Tiberius did not want to fight. His main task was to strengthen the principate, which he did. Augustus's will was a good excuse here, but hardly a policy-determining factor. His retaliatory action against the Germans is not a renewed offensive against Germany, but only to stabilize the situation along the Rhine. Caligula, on the other hand, who succeeded Tiberius, needed a good war of conquest. From the son of Germanicus, avenged for Teutoburg, expected new military achievements, and Caligula himself, especially after the beginning of the confrontation with the Senate, needed support from the plebs, and there is nothing better for this than a triumph and celebrations on the occasion of victory. The point of application of efforts was quickly determined. Britain. There were several birds with one stone. Britain was rich in minerals, which were actively sold to the continent. Local states were weak and did not represent a serious force. From the point of view of propaganda, the conquest of Britain was not just a repetition of the feat of the divine Caesar, but the return of imperial territories. All in all, it was a very good idea from all sides. Only Caligula, because of an overdose of steel in his body, could not fulfill this dream. But Claudius, who succeeded him, needed a small, victorious war even more. The emperor who received the throne from the Praetorians was considered by many to be a weak and weak-willed man, unfit to lead the state. Therefore, a decisive and successful conquest campaign had to show everyone that Claudius is worthy of his place. And the war left by Caligula came as never before. Blitzkrieg from the invasion no one expected, although the campaign dragged on for 40 years, also unlikely. Claudius was quite satisfied when at the end of 43 he personally accepted the surrender of several leaders of the defeated communities. Claudius got his triumph, the Roman aristocracy got land grants and many slaves, and the plebs got feasts and distributions in honor of their victories. But what did the empire get after the conquest? Until the middle of the second century, Britain was a rebellious land, where rebellions broke out every now and then. The empire managed to subdue the entire south and center of England, but the north was too harsh. It was almost impossible to farm there, and the local Celts were extremely stubborn resistance. And this imposed a significant imprint on the whole strategy of the Romans in Britain. One of the key features of Roman conquests was that their economic aspect was always adjacent to the military aspect. The Roman frontier ensured the security of the heartland. The frontier on the Rhine may have caused as many losses as it wanted, but it protected Italy, Gaul, and Spain from barbarian invasions, and these brought in a lot of revenue. But Britain, isolated by the sea, in no way protected the Roman heartland, but at the same time it itself, even after the conquest, had to keep in obedience an impressive garrison of 50,000 legionaries and auxiliary troops. And this garrison could not be withdrawn or significantly weakened, 
as the threat of barbarian invasions on the island has always existed, and since the garrison of the island defended only the island itself, to make the game worth the candle, Britain had to bring more income than was spent on its maintenance. Estimating costs is impossible due to a complete lack of data, but it is clear that these expenditures were huge, although in many ways extraordinary. The money was spent once. The Romans conquered Britain not for the sake of agriculture, but for the metals with which the island was rich. In Britain were mined iron, silver, gold, copper, tin, lead. Thus, by mining metals, Britain could more than cover the lack of productivity of its own agriculture. But research so far suggests that most of the metals mined were used by the Romans on the island itself. In the commercial turnover outside the island, this metal simply did not get, and the costs of military purchases of metal were spent on the island itself. The same was true for most of the other metals, except for silver, gold, and tin. The question about their contribution to the budget, unfortunately, cannot be resolved without accurate information about the level of production. But there is one indirect evidence that allows us to assess the scale of the problem. Strabo, describing Britain about 20 years after the beginning of its conquest, claimed that all taxes collected from it were lower than the duties from trade alone before the conquest. Conquering Britain was an extremely expensive undertaking for Rome, with no obvious economic or military bonuses. Legions stationed in Britannia were effectively shut off from the overall task of defending the empire's borders and focused solely on maintaining order in Britain. The island's agriculture only managed to become self-sufficient for its population by the third century, and that with a number of caveats. The growth of metal mining also provided little help to the Roman military economy, as much of this growth was offset by a significant increase in consumption in the province itself. That is, at this point we can say with a certain degree of certainty that the Roman conquest of Britain was a case where the conquered got much more than the conqueror. But what is paradoxical is that the Romans were not that bothered by this, that Britain consumed a lot of money, they probably guessed, if not knew, about it. But the Roman worldview was such that when it came to the state and its good, the material was a slightly lower priority than the intangible. The Roman elite, though it received considerable income from conquests, thought in broader categories. And any war, any conquest was seen not only as a business project, but also as part of the effort to ensure the security and greatness of Rome. The political aspects of conquering and holding Britain were much more important to the Romans than its economic role, and it would take an absolutely catastrophic situation in the state for the Romans to decide to withdraw from Britain.